Dark Shelf, we're back at Con 2011. I'm trying. I'm doing different in intros, so I they're real. Okay, and I do different. I do different extras as well. I'm Gavin Stevens. I'm here with Leonard Kirk, and we're we're artist extraordinaire. Can you give us a brief backstory, background on what what, what you've worked on? Oh uh, no, actually, uh, <laughs> I've been a little bit too long. Uh, well, let's see. Uh, uh, probably my biggest break was uh, getting into DC Comics. Beforehand, I, I did a number of independent titles, independent smaller publishers, some stuff familiar like Planet of the Apes, Alien Nation, things like that. But then uh, my big break came with DC when uh, I wound up getting the gig for Supergirl. It was supposed to just be a fill-in job, but I wound up doing the book for six years. And uh, that led me on to a number of other great projects with DC, uh, JSA, uh, Aquaman, Bloodhound, which was one of my favorites. And after that, I bounced around a few more uh, publishers again. Top Cow, uh, working on Freshman. Calvin, we'll and get uh, meet Roberta at the front of the Toronto Comic Con entrance. Which is always good. This is always good for an interview. Roberta at the front. Thank you. Okay. All right. If he doesn't get to the front pretty soon, I'm going to kick the shit out of him. Have anyway, you been calling him for a while? I have no idea. But anyway, uh, let's see. Oh, yes. I was at uh, Top Cow. And then I wound up signing uh, on with Marvel about six years. I've been exclusive with them since. And some of the projects uh, I'm really proud of working with uh, them were uh, Agents of Atlas, uh, Captain Britain, and uh, Marvel Adventures, uh, the, the Avengers title on there, uh, New Mutants, which I just uh, wrapped up my arc on that, and now I'm, uh, my per current project is uh, Sigil. Sigil, yeah, you showed me some of that. What do you, and this is part of Sigil right here? Yep. Yep, this is uh, part of issue three. And and it's Nick Fury. No, it's not Nick Fury. No, it's not Nick no. Fury. But yeah. it looks like Nick Fury. It looks like him. Ultimate's Nick Fury. It, it, it only, yeah, it only looks like, well, they have, I have no idea what color he's going to be yet, so we'll find out. Um, <laughs> but actually, he's, uh, no, he's just a pirate guy <laughs> on board the ship, uh, and uh, he just happens to be bald. <laughs> <laughs> pirate guy? Yeah, what a, one of assorted pirates. So, well, the, the, uh, 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 the bulk of this particular uh, story, it's a four-issue arc for now. I have no idea what's going to happen afterwards. Uh, the bulk of it ends up taking place uh, in, uh, in the 1600s on a pirate ship. Uh, and uh, Always a party time. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Fantastic time. Yeah. Uh, the story uh, mainly features a uh, young girl uh, uh, named uh, Samantha Ray, who was a typical high schooler in 20th century, not in pirate time. She winds up being transported. To pirate. But they all, but both times they look like uh, uh, like they're on the set of Twilight. Pretty much, yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. They uh, they are missing werewolves, at least so far. I, I haven't seen the script for the issue four yet. Okay. <laughs> so there are vampires in this? Uh, no, no. Uh, pirate vampires? No, uh, I no. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I I've drawn vampires. It was fun with Captain Britain. There were vampires in there, but the second somebody. Uh, the second somebody puts a vampire in the midst of teenagers in a high school, you know, that's, uh, you know, fuck it, I'm out. That's it. Why are vampires still in high school? You know, that is a question I have asked. I, I mean, why aren't, why are vampires still in high school, and why aren't they fucking wealthy? I mean, they have that bloody, even if they are not financial wizards, just put a penny in a bank and wait a thousand years. Agree, or real estate. Buy stuff like way back when. Oh, they don't even have to buy it. They can just go in and kill everybody. Thank you. Take the deed. Yeah, exactly. I, I always want to see vampires that work at like 24-hour grocery stores. <laughs> like check out people. Like, like loser vampires. Well, yeah, but unfortunately they also would not be able to do a full shift because eventually the sun does come up in 24 hours. So It's true. <laughs> <laughs> they put that on their on their resume. I uh, under special skills. Exactly, and of course, if they happen to work too far north or too far south, they're going to be a number of days where they just can't come into work at all. You know, it's. I don't think too far north or too far south has grocery stores. Um, probably not. Although I wouldn't be surprised if there were at least a few WalMarts. <laughs> Where you get everything at Walmart. I like how we degenerated into Walmart. That's awesome. Oh, it's fantastic. I, well, one of my favorite books that you worked on was Agents of Atlas. And uh, do you miss that book dearly? Does it like? It haunts my every waking moment. Um, at least when I'm sober. But uh, actually, 
I do miss this. I do miss the book. It was a, a hell of a lot of fun to work on. The the range of characters are just so fantastic, and I just loved the fact that we were blending some newer characters with a bunch of older characters that. You know, just a mishmash, almost a mishmash group that that, that you see here, or there. That they were originally part of a line of comics that were published under the uh, the, the mantle Atlas some years ago. At least uh, bulk of the team, uh, including uh, uh, Namora and uh, Jimmy Wu, who was fighting his his enemy, the Golden Claw. We made it a little bit more politically correct. It used to be called the Yellow Claw. Wow. Yes, and uh, and in fact, if you saw some of the colored comic books, I. Uh, he actually was colored yellow, <laughs> but then again, all people of Asian descent were back in those days. That's how the that's it's just fact. It was that and people smoking. That was uh, pretty much it. <laughs> and the yellow stain on their ceilings above them. Exactly. Uh, but the book was just a, abs just a load of fun. I, I mean the. Uh, the scripts were terrific. The cast was fantastic. Uh, I got to draw such amazingly ridiculous. I, I mean. I got everything. I got to draw a talking gorilla, one of my absolute favorite things. I actually, sorry to cut you off, I figured out the name, the character, uh, Rip Torn. Rip Torn, uh, that's what the talking gorilla reminds me of. Oh. That, get in the... Yeah, yeah. That's who we, like, a gruff old dude that takes care of business. Definitely, definitely. Um, unfortunately, I did not use him as a model for the character, so he can't sue me or anything. Good, good. So just just may, uh, know that. But uh, yes, he was without a doubt my absolute favorite. My second favorite had to be M11. A character says absolutely nothing throughout the whole thing, but he's just, you know, a walking, talking 1950s, well, actually, I just said, no, no talking. A walking robot from the 1950s, you know, with a chest door and death rays coming out of his face. And which is pretty much all robots did in the 50s. I, whenever I, I, they did a grid on the on the um, uh, Venture Brothers. They did. A, they had that alien come down. And da, 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 da. That's how I picture. That's what that is. That throwback of that. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, and of course you had the character Venus, who could just basically turn everybody into mush just by just by talking, just by singing, and what have you. Um, Jimmy Woo, who was as I mentioned, Golden Claw's arch nemesis, he ends up standing out because he was an FBI agent in the good old days uh, but of course the series takes place in the year two th in the 2000s so he's some um, you know very very old guy he winds up being rejuvenated turned young again unfortunately it could not preserve his memories so it's for him it's still like it's like he's just arrived from like 1955 so he's stunned by everything around him, you know, internet, uh, rapid transit, uh, the price of coffee. Uh, every <laughs> this is outrageous! Which is terrific. Uh, and, uh, and of course we have Marvel Boy, uh, yes. a.k.a. Bob. Yeah. It is called him Bob, which I love. And uh, the real Marvel Boy. As we discovered, there was a character uh, who, uh, oh, what was his name? Was it uh, Quasar? who uh, Marvel Boy wound up becoming Quasar. Well, now we've, learned, we've since learned that was not the real Marvel Boy. The real Marvel Boy was in suspended animation. He had, he had basically become a permanent resident on Venus. And, uh, and he came back to Earth just to rejoin the Atlas team to help save Jimmy Woo. And how cool is it that they traveled around in a flying saucer? Yeah. A saucer! That was something I really looked forward to when Jeff Parker, uh, the writer, had described the characters to me, described uh, Bob and his environment. Um, he, he just wanted something, again, very sort of 50s-ish, which is really where I got the design for the spacesuit. You know, I mean, right out of uh, things like, uh, you, you know, Mission to, or, or uh, oh, what's the name of that one again? Uh, the, uh, Dad Gummit. Oh, I forgot it. Anyway, <laughs> I, you're like me. I like. There's so much up there. Like rocket ship X7 and um, uh, the the uh, lost in space. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. That sort of route. But it came from outer space. That's the one I was trying to okay. think of. It, uh, their spacesuits. But uh, I, I also envisioned the interior of the ship. I originally designed to be much more Wally Wood sort of style, with lots of levers and knobs and and everything. But uh, Jeff felt that the ship would, should probably be a little bit more Spartan and modern. But we kept the uh, old-style spacesuit to go with it, which uh, was fine with me because it 
I, I think it was a nice blend. It worked well with the story, and it was a hell of a lot easier to draw. <laughs> okay, here's a question I've been asking everyone that I've interviewed today. It's part of Dork Shelf's cu custom. You're a nerd. You're geeky. Uh, you like collectibles. What kind of uh, interesting? What is the most interesting thing do you ha that you have on your Dork Shelf? Oh, truth to tell, I I have collectibles, but I've never been super big into it. Probably the it's hard to pick one though when, when I get down to it. There, there are two in particular. One is I, I actually have a, a friend of mine was getting rid of a bunch of stuff and uh, he said, hey, I've got some old uh, Star Trek figures, the old Mego line from the 70s, and not, unfortunately not the first, but like the second generation. They still have 1974 stamped on the back of them. Still in the original packaging. Would anybody be interested? And I said, well, which ones you got? Okay, right there. And he said, would you like to buy one or two? And I, I said, I'll take all of them. <laughs> and so I got a great big box of those delivered to me one day. They're still in their packaging. You can't take one or two. It's like crack. No, absolutely not. Uh, but actually, uh, probably the, the, the one that I find the most interesting of the bunch was uh, Marvel came out with a, a toy line a few years ago based on Transformers. They take the Marvel characters and they transform to something else. And one of them was the Punisher. And this, the people have talked about this. Uh, I was at a Mid-Ohio Con one year and Bob Ingersoll came over and he showed me the Punisher toy. I said, you gotta look at this. And it's like, it just looks like the Punisher. And he starts to change and he changes into a gun. Yeah. But midway through the transformation, if you twist it just right and do this, the barrel of the gun lands square in his crotch. Just like right there. <laughs> I saw that and I said, oh my God, where, who's selling this? I said, well, didn't have him at the show, but there was a toy store uh, about half a mile away where he spotted that. And I, the, after the show was over, I immediately ran over there. I bought the last three that were on the shelf because I thought for sure somebody's just going to pull this whole line out of here. I just had to have those. Um, so now you have, you have three transforming phallic punishers. Yes. Yes. Okay. Are you going to sell them to any cougars that you know? <laughs> um, well, depending on what I'll get, you know, I may give them, you know, I just... <laughs> Charity? Hey, absolutely, you know, I, I, I'm not the kind of guy who'll walk into a bar and say, hey, I'll buy you a drink or something like that. I'll come in, you know, would you, would you like a phallic punisher? You just slide it on the table. Exactly. You don't say anything. Exactly, exactly. Well, and what's really funny is actually on the box... One of the images, as because the, they show the transformation, yeah. one of them actually shows with him well, like this, with his legs splayed, and there's the bear. And this thing actually came out like this. So, like nobody at the company was like, uh, you know, we got a problem. Fire that man. Nobody, exactly. And that's what I was waiting for. I was waiting for. That's why I grabbed him up, and I thought, well, they take him off the shelf for sure. And I'm waiting for the story saying, you know, massive recall or something like, or even just a little blip. Nothing. Nothing. Nobody did anything about it. A couple of years ago, uh, they had this uh, uh, toy on the market. It was called the Tube Snake. I kid you not. It was a long tubular thing. You filled it with water and you <laughs> shot kids. And the commercial was these kids shooting each other and the water is hitting them in the face and on the chest. I'm like, Nobody's, nobody saw this? How does that get past? No. I have no... You know, all it's going to... Well, all it's going to take is just one kid... Just one kid somewhere thinking, you know, you know, oh man, the faucet's not working. Let's grab some milk. <laughs> this this interview degenerated. It was awesome. Thank you, Leonard Kirk, for being on Dirt Show. You are very, very welcome, sir. Can you do you want to plug your website or anything? People can catch you. You know, I keep forgetting the name of mine. I, I, I have a blog. Uh, if you can just blog out there, Leonard Kirk and blog, you'll find it. I believe that it is uh, leonardkirk.comicblock, B-L-O-C. Everything for you will come up. If they, uh, Yes. I, I'll put a little thing so that... Yes, and you will find you'll find on my blog, I will occasionally talk about work, I will occasionally talk about my comics and whatnot, uh, but most of the time I will bitch and rant about whatever the heck is pissing me off that week. Which is the best part of blog. Oh, absolutely. It is a load of fun. And fair warning out there, there are a number of four-letter words and at least two or three eight-letter words. Not after the Punisher phallic thing. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. I'm Gavin Stevens. At, we're at dorkshelf.com at the Toronto Comic Con 2011. See you. See, that's the other closer I'm doing.